so we're coming from north of the border tonight folks um radio amateurs of canada we're going to talk a little bit tonight about let me see if i can get this to why is this not closing back down We'll look at uh, Canadian Emergency Management Systems and the Auxiliary Communication Service. So, first of all, we'll take a quick look at Radio Amateurs of Canada so that you understand. And as Steve just alluded to, at one point in time in 1993, we were CRRL and CARF, two organizations that came together to form Radio Amateurs of Canada. We are the voice uh, internationally and local and here in Canada for uh, amateurs across the country, representing more than 70,000 amateur radio operators in Canada. However, our membership at this time is around, it's a little higher than 4,600 now. We're sitting about 5,000. Our organizational structure, we are, we have two paid um Vol uh, paid members that work for us all the rest of us are volunteers so whether we are executives or directors we are all volunteers so obviously sometimes getting some of this work done takes a little bit of time um, some days people want it to be done like yesterday and unfortunately it comes about a week later so that's a little bit about radio amateurs of canada um, let's take a look now at the similarities and differences between Canada and the U.S. and its emergency management systems. So first up, we'll look at the levels of emergency management response. And here you're going to notice that <clears throat> our response and your response are pretty close when it comes to local responses, community. We have regions here in some parts of Canada that are attached to major cities like the GTA. So we have York region and Peel region, but they're essentially counties. We have our provincial response. You have your state response. Uh, where it changes is at our federal level. So at your federal level, you have a number of organizations that assist in emergency management, namely FEMA. We have Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness Canada. Uh, what just happened there? That's not the button. I'm getting there. There we go. All right. So just to start, before we get into the particulars about emergency management, what I'd like to do is I'd like to educate you a little bit about the density of the of Canada's population. Now, if you're looking at this, you'll see a little red line across that screen, and that represents 100 kilometers from the U.S. border. It's not the border itself. It's 100 kilometers or 60 miles. So what you're going to find is the majority of our population actually falls within about 100 to 200 kilometers of the U.S. border. There are some areas that spread further north, but for the most part, that is where all of our resources, all of our infrastructure, everything sort of builds, okay? So our communication systems, everything sort of follows that 100 kilometer to 200 kilometer line when it's, you know, being set up and distributed across Canada. Now, the black area there, it does have communities up there. It's just not as populated as where you see these little white lines and, and uh, colored lines further south. All right, so that we do have a number of northern communities in that that um, don't always get 100% of the services that uh, our service providers actually offer. Come on. All right, <clears throat> so here we look at the framework, an emergency management framework for Canada, ministries responsible for emergency management. This actually comes out of our national program. All right, so we use a framework and it establishes common approach for various federal, provincial and territorial initiatives, especially in emergency management. All right, so we don't have set plans 
or programs that define a national response, we use a framework and provinces and territories fall within that framework. So we'll look at the framework that includes the provinces. <clears throat> and you'll see there's a timeline here of changes in Canada. So July 4th at a Council of the Federation, all right, that's where all of our premiers come together and meet at a first minister's meeting. The federal government tried to develop coordinated strategies for emergency response and readiness for Canada. And the provinces agreed that they would take part in these. However, they asked that provincial and territorial laws and plans that had already been put in place be respected by the national government. So what does that mean? That means that our province and territories all have doctrines and legislation that are in place and were in place before federal frameworks started to be developed to a level where we started working together, all right? And it, today we still have this breakdown in our services. 90% of all emergency management operational response never meets the federal level. It all stays within the province. <clears throat> the objectives primarily through provincial development is collaboration between provinces, counties, and local emergency plans. There's a lot of coordination there. Cultivating a climate for cooperation and mutual aid planning. So a lot of what you guys see from your state level, your county levels, and that are pretty much the same thing that you'll see here in Canada. At our provincial levels and our territory levels, we look at best practices. We look at how agencies can work within agencies. But what it's also done is it's diversified emergency management in such a way where we have out, outside vendors almost that come in and they help to promote emergency management, emergency management training, ideas and philosophies. Vendors like the International Association of Emergency Management. Now it was founded in the US and it is very active here in Canada. We have our own division up here in Canada and it does provide services for members. You have to be a member of this organization. There's networking and professional development there's training opportunities for certificates and that. So um, for managers that have been in the field for a long period of time and they want to upgrade or they want to have additional services, they are able to use programs like this that are accredited by provinces, by territories to update their skills and be more inundated with the knowledge that they need for today's emergency management, uh, I guess, play, playing field. <clears throat> Along with that, you'll find that there are partnership agencies, much the same as what you guys have in the States. We have groups like Team Rubicon. Um, we have Salvation Army. You're familiar with the Red Cross. You might be familiar with some of these organizations. Some may be just in Canada. But along with this, Promoting emergency management in our provinces, there are some provinces that have actually gone to associations of emergency managers because of the diversity and that, and the fact that we'll talk about in a few minutes of the way that the federal system has changed over the past few years. So one of the programs is resiliency building. So by working with other organizations, strengthening and collaborating, they are able to fill needs and fill, you know, those, those missing pieces through these partner organizations, emergency management groups that aren't always for government agencies. <clears throat> All right. So you can have in Ontario, we have um, Ontario Power Generation, which has changed its name just recently, but when I was doing my training, we actually had an instructor come in from Hydro One to help teach our emergency management training. Why? Because they are a partnership with the Ontario Association 
of emergency managers. So we empower groups, organizations, and that, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. All right. <clears throat> so, again, when we are looking at disasters and that, mutual aid is not enough states or provinces can declare a disaster and bring resources in from a national system. All right. Now, this, this statements here were actually found out of a U.S. Um, documentation that was actually switched to be able to be used in Canada. But the systems are very similar between state and provincial resources and how we mobilize in that. What we will see some of the changes is, is in our federal system and our federal response system. Ugh. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> so this framework that we put in place also impacts our federal system. All right. Now, Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness Canada, they're the, uh, the authors of this framework. And the framework does talk about a federal system, but it complements provinces and territories. It does not tell them what to do. It is there to assist based on the requirements of each emergency as they arise. All right. <clears throat> Under a new Emergency Management Act that replaced the original Emergency Preparedness Act, plans for re the responsibilities of federal department changed again, um, and we'll see it, how why it came about to a division called Public Safety Canada and Emergency Preparedness. All right, or Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Sorry, we're so used to calling it Public Safety Canada up here. But it is, in fact, Canada's version of FEMA. Now, they do have field offices like FEMA does. They do not have a field organization in which they send out to respond to a lot of emergencies. They do have a field organization for um, some uh, projects. Most of it is collaboration between provinces, territories, and the federal uh, government and building new programs or working on existing programs and that and you'll see here in the next part that prior to this development most of our emergency preparedness was handled by the department of national defense one major event changed the canadian reorganization of federal government and we all know this event um i'm sure everybody that w remembers where they were and it was 9 11. <clears throat> so part of this department of public safety and emergency preparedness also looks at um similar programs that your u.s department of homeland security does other than, you know, as it says here, it does not patrol our waterways and that. <clears throat> the Emergency Management Act was passed in 2007, and it actually named the Ministry of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness as the enforcer, who is responsible under the Act for many things, including conducting exercises and providing education and training related to emergency management. However, it also goes to say that ministers of the crown. Now, I know you guys don't have those terms, so let me explain that. We have ministries, you have departments. So we have federal ministries, we have provincial ministries. <clears throat> they all are representatives of what we once called the crown. Uh, we don't use that too much anymore, but in all our official documentation, it's still a minister of the crown and a ministry of the crown. So what they've done is they've put onus on these ministries to prepare emergency plans and you know respect of those at risk maintain test implement plans conduct exercises training 
in relationship to those plans. <clears throat> so in effect, from a federal level, they have supported the provinces in doing their thing. So we really do have 13 different types of planning across this country. We have 10 provinces and we have three territories. The federal plan is there just to support that there. All right, and that comes under the Federal Emergency Response Management System, or FIRMS. Now, FIRMS is loosely based in Incident Command System, and we'll talk about Incident Command in a few minutes. But we also have the Secretariat from the Treasury Board, and it is about integrated risk management. So I'm going to show you a bit of the structure here in a minute, but... The idea here is creating both vertical horizontal integration and also integration between federal emergency response actions and of the and those of the provinces. Now a lot of this is financially based. There is some training materials, there is working groups that collaborate on communication advancements and other programs to make things work together or mesh together across Canada. So, let's see if I can do this without pulling up the participants again. The governance comes from all three levels. Even though it's a, it's a federal plan, the government comes from all three levels and the ministries that are responsible for emergency management. All right. Operationally, though, you'll see that a lot of this takes place in the provinces. Critical infrastructure, communications, First Nations... All of this stuff all comes from provincial response programs. So <clears throat> we have, again, established that we have a national support system. Not so much a governance, but more of a support system. About 80 to 90 percent of our, our, our operational level is handled from the provincial level and their collaboration with counties and local government or even larger communities. <clears throat> but public safety has also added in to this system, and I'll pull this up here, another emergency management strategy towards a resilient Canada for the year 2030. Now, this is not a Canadian program, as you can see here. It was developed out of the United Nations. And so far, to all of the knowledge that I have and the research that I've done, British Columbia and Quebec are the only two provinces that have sort of committed to this 100%. <clears throat> it's an interesting read. It is available online for anybody that wants to read it. Um, you can research it under the... Uh, the um, Public Safety Canada website, but what it talks about, it, it talks about a resilient capacity and how it's built through empowering citizens, responders, organizations, communities, governments, so on and so forth, and, and I'm sure you can read this as I talk. So here is where we come back to those vendors, <clears throat> those organizations that are coming in to assist with educating individuals about emergency management about working with communities, working with people. But it also gives us, as amateur radio community, the opportunity to take part in helping to build this resilience, which isn't always easy with being that we are a national society for amateur radio and not actually an emergency management NGO. <clears throat> All right, so I want you to keep some of that in mind and also keep in mind how the population is set up in Canada, all right? Because a lot of the stuff that we're going to look at in a few minutes and why we're doing things is to benefit how our Canadian structure is set up. <clears throat> but I did say a minute ago that we would t that our federal system was loosely based on the good old incident incident command system. Sorry. Let me just grab a drink here, guys. So emergency measures across Canada does have 
incident ICS, all right? However, it was introduced to Canada in British Columbia, mid-90s, as you see here. <clears throat> Later on in the 2000s, it was integrated by uh, the Canadian uh, Interagency Force Fire Center, all right? So you see that there is the CIFFC. So Canada actually was sort of introduced to ICS much the same as the U.S. was, all right? ICS came to be out of the California Firefight uh, Firefighting Associations <clears throat> for wildlife, uh, wildfire ma uh, forest management and that. So here it's fitting that in Canada, this is how it sort of came to be. Firefighters got on board with it. It worked for them and they started to introduce ICS. However, unlike the U.S., we do not have a federal program like NIMS. All right, and, and we have seen NIMS talked about through the ACS programs. So that sort of leaves us open to, again, every province doing their own thing, every province having their own systems, their own laws, and everything else. And it kind of impacts us when it comes to management systems. So across Canada, we actually have two systems, ICS. Now, the ICS Canada webpage, you, you're more than welcome to go there and look it up. For those of you doing uh, emergency management in the U.S., you'll recognize a lot of the material because it's all out of your NIMS program. There are some documentation that has been changed for Canada. It is a group of individuals that work together collaborating on developing ICS across Canada. It has been approved by a number of the provinces and uh, the territories. However, Ontario, <coughs> um, several years back, decided that they wanted to build their own system. So if you want to find out about the incident management system, you actually have to go to the Ontario Emergency Management uh, Program. And uh, this was developed exclusively for Ontario. It is loosely tied into ICS, and uh, I am going to show you a couple of documents so you can see what I mean by that. But we do not have, again, a national structure to incident command. We sort of run a little bit loose on that. So the first one here is actually out of the ICS program. And as you can see here, it's pretty structured. Everything right down to the units the groups all of that now in ontario it's a little bit different <clears throat> so you'll see at the bottom there a lot of our units are left open we have less of a top control and more of a adaptable system so that um you can pretty much pick it apart and use it as you want to. As a matter of fact, when I did my IMS training and my emergency management training through Simcoe County and that, one of our instructors actually was telling the future community emergency management coordinators that, no, you don't need to use the whole system. You use what you need. The rest of it, just set it aside. <clears throat> so that may be a little bit different than what you guys see down in the U.S. Because I know when I did South Carolina's Oxcom course, they were pretty adamant about ICS and using it to its fullest to better their system. We have, again, that same issue across Canada. <clears throat> so it becomes very difficult when you look at instant command, you look at uh, ICS, you look at the structures of each of our provinces governing themselves when it comes to emergency management, <clears throat> a national support system that encourages these governments to do what they need to do because they know what they need to do. All right, so there are the, the similarities. The state knows what the state needs. The, the county knows what the county needs. So we have that sort of breakdown that same system 
but there are differences. We do have other groups and agencies that are involved in our emergency management structure. And um, some of them do have some very vital roles in our emergency management structure. <clears throat> so again, that's a little bit of insight on emergency management in Canada. You can see that many people think that we have this majorly different program than what you have down in the US. We don't. Most of our systems run similar to yours. We have federal support, we have county and state support, we have local support, and again, emergency preparedness starts with us as the individual. Now the resiliency thing, that might be something that's a little bit different down in the US, but it does play a role for amateur radio. And as I move away from emergency management and now go more into why we are looking at auxiliary communications as a national society based on, you know, our emergency management needs here, <clears throat> the resilience part gives us the opportunity to build a program with agencies to help them become more resilient. Not so much so that RAC becomes more resilient, but so that those agencies become more resilient. And I hope that makes a little bit of sense, and I'm sure I'll get a lot of questions later on. <clears throat> Sorry. So why the move? Well, let's start with the basics. Radio Amateurs of Canada, like I said, is a national society. We have affiliations with the International Radio Union. Um, we're not an emergency management NGO. We never have been. We, we have the capacity to assist in an emergency by providing communications. But we are not mainstream emergency management. So we know very little bit about how emergency management works. For many years, <clears throat> our system relied strictly on emergency coordinators to build relationships with local community emergency management. All right, there was not a lot of exchange from that local level to a national level. And through collaboration with the stakeholders in emergency management, we have learned, we have educated ourselves, and we're hoping to continue to learn to provide better services for, you know, vendors, private NGOs, groups, whatever we have out there that may have communication systems or may not. <clears throat> so my role as the community services officer was to sit down and look at what we had and work within our management organization. And of course, the first thing we had to look at was the hardest thing for everybody nowadays, mitigate liabilities. And this is just part of the list that came up over a year's worth of research and, and looking into problems and that. Accountability was the first. Accountability in training, accountability to our members and working with the public. Content issues, I'll talk about that one in a minute. <clears throat> All right. Policies and procedures to protect not only our members, but also our organization. So this has been an ongoing issue now for the better part of a decade. And after a year of a lot of work, we had to start someplace. So accountability was one of the first places we started. And accountability with emergency measures was a critical part of this development. That falls back again into training. <clears throat> RAC had a training manual, an Aries training manual. We did have elements in there about ICS. We had elements about radio operations, so on and so forth. But we didn't have the accountability when it came from an agency or an NGO directing us as to what they needed specifically. <clears throat> the content that we were training was out of date. Emergency management is constantly changing, updating, and that. So we really needed to start looking at 
if we're going to move forward with a program in Canada, what is the best way to do it? And that's reaching out to our um, stakeholders, talk about insurance. How do we get insured through them? How do we put policies and procedures in place with their recommendations that work for both amateur radio and their organizations? In doing my due diligence, <clears throat> one of the things that always comes to play is radio regulations. And how do they play on us when we are developing a program like Oxcom? So I went to the top, <clears throat> and the top is the ITU, Radio Regulations Article 25. And as you can see here under Article 25, these articles were done at the World uh, Radio Conferences that happen every couple of years. Um, it's not just amateur radio that goes to this. This is attended by agencies and anybody that has something to do with radio spectrum. So what really caught my eye was 25.9, where it says administrations are encouraged to take the necessary steps to allow amateur stations to be prepared for and meet communication needs in the support of disaster relief. So as an administration, even though we are just a volunteer administration, it is part of my due diligence to make sure that amateur radio stations are properly prepared to meet these communication needs, to help support with disaster relief programs. So why not start looking at the future? Why continuously sit in a place where part of it is working, other parts aren't working? <clears throat> so, after reaching out to my American friends and around the world, the one thing I came across was a general definition of what auxiliary communication is. And it talks about, you know, a broad range of communications. And really, when you look at this, about 90% of it is amateur radio. But there are some differences. So how do we work within an auxiliary communications setup and still be amateur radio operators? That takes a little bit more work. So developing... RAC's auxiliary communication program started again with communications. That was between RAC and other agencies, not within the RAC system. So we approached national level agencies and started to talk to them about what would they need. How could Radio Amateurs of Canada provide communicators that would assist with their programs? We looked at accountable training systems. You guys tell us what we need to train our people, not us telling you. Roles and responsibilities. Who's in charge? Who do they report to? Checks and balances. Making sure our people meet their requirements. And of course, insurance is always insurance. Standard methodologies and training. <clears throat> now, we're actually kind of lucky here in Canada because we have the Emergency Management NGO Consortium of Canada. Iraq is one of the founding members. It was formed in 2019. And as you can see, it enhances collaboration. It represents the member organizations in all manners of emergency management. And the idea is to cultivate a climate for cooperation, best practices, everything. So being a part of this organization has actually opened up a lot of doors when it came to finding out the information that we needed to move forward. And with talking with these organizations, they didn't want to buy into another radio service. They didn't want to look at the past where we've had issues, and I'm not gonna get into a lot of those. What they needed and what a lot of them came to me and said was, we need communicators. We need individuals that we can collectively bring into our organization <clears throat> and free up members of our team to do jobs that they're trained to do while these individuals are able to do our communications, whether it be through their communication systems, amateur radio. Always having our toolbox will be an asset. 
but being able to qualify to work within somebody else's communications program is a bigger asset. So one of the things that came out of these talks was the biggest asset we have as amateur radio operators is our skill set. Whether it be our personal skill sets from what we've collected over the years or our skills in operations of radio and other communications. <clears throat> so with that, we took it to the next level and we went to the provinces. At this point in time, <clears throat> we have some relationship building with the province of Ontario. And no, in, in case those Canadians that are sitting here, they're looking at this and they're saying, wait a minute, that's not all the provinces and territories. You're right. I ran out of room. All right. So enhance collaboration with provincial programs. Present the RAC Auxiliary Communications Program. See what kind of support we can get from these provinces with a whole new methodology with a new way of thinking and how to again cultivate a climate for cooperation with these groups all of which we will hope will leverage best practices between our organization and their organizations so that we can build a better program <clears throat> don't worry guys i'm quickly coming to the end next part this is the rack auxiliary communications Yes, it is going to assume the role of our amateur radio emergency services. So I know a lot of you guys are Aries in the U.S. There's nothing wrong with the Aries program. Don't read too much into it. The rebranding and repurposing of our services has a lot more to do than what I'm getting into in this. This is just a general overview. I will be doing a presentation in January in which we will be inviting all of our RAC affiliated clubs to see <clears throat> and at that time we will go more in depth as to why we are changing to auxiliary communications the plan moving forward so on and so forth but in essence we are looking at a role that RAC becomes a training agency we will take standards laid out to us by agencies and NGOs across the country and we'll put it into a program so that our operators will meet a minimum standard and be able to adapt to both local obligations and if they're called to other areas or other places across the country they will be able to assist <clears throat> we are currently at stage one of our development and this is a, an overview so please don't read too much into this it is not finalized it's still in development and nothing is in stone we're looking at a auxiliary communications training plan and also a communications operation plan at this level. So again, three-tiered operational system, three-tiered training plan. Basic operations will be designed for non-deployable individuals. And I'll talk about that in a second. Fundamentals of emergency communications or the OXCOM program that you have in the U.S. That program will be designed so that you will go through the steps and procedures to become qualified to be in the field and work for these outside agencies. The advanced communication, emergency communications and operations will be for additional services that we'll be looking at later on down the road, including that of the rapid response team and our section disaster support groups. It'll also look at command and control structure for when we are not activated but um, that is where we are at today. We are at stage one. We're finalizing some of these ideas for stage one. And we are now getting ready to meet with the NGOs and agencies to see how they feel about this program. <clears throat> the three levels of training will meet the requirements not only of served agencies and NGOs, but it'll be more adaptable to individual lifestyles. And this is why we are introducing a basic program not everybody will be able to deploy i am 51 years old and due to an injury 10 years ago i no longer have the good use of my left knee so will i be able to deploy in some situations probably not so how do i fit in to the auxiliary communications program what if i can become an asset from home 
what if I have enough training that I can do certain jobs from home or from a remote location where I'm not deployed in the field, where I'm not a burden to the system, but I can still help. We have to take all of that into consideration. We are volunteers. RAC is, again, the National Society for a Volunteer Group of Amateur Radio Operators. The rebranding also helps with marketability to agencies and the general public. Now, <clears throat> I got a chance to meet a man, Hank, here. And I love this quote, so I put it in here. <clears throat> it really sums up a lot of the stuff that we're looking at trying to do. Which is, you know, we are going to train individuals. We as a parent organization have no operational control. There is nobody ever going to call up Jason Tremblay and say, we have a disaster, we need you to come in as a communication leader. All right? It's never going to happen. But I am going to be able to train individuals to work with other communication leaders to fulfill jobs within their own organizations through whatever method that is needed and through their command and control structure. So thanks to Hank for this. It has been a great asset in, in educating people about what we're looking at trying to do. And uh, I will continue to use it as long as he tells me it's okay. <clears throat> now the third reason we are looking at our auxiliary communications program. A little while ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with the Northwest Territories. And the problem in the Northwest Territories is communications. It really is. We have about 38 communities up there that lose communications at least once a month. Now, some of them are about 50 kilometers away, 50 miles away, sorry, from Alaska. And airways don't stop between Canada and Alaska. So what I was able to do was I was able to reach out to Steve Waterman and John Peterson, who's on the call. Both of them are on the call tonight. They introduced me to um, uh, Merlin, Ross Merlin. Sorry if I got his name wrong. Steve will correct me later. And a couple of individuals from FEMA. So we sat down and we had a chance to talk and we looked at how our organizations could work together to come up with a framework in which communications were possible. And during my research through this pandemic where we've had to shut down, reopen, shut down, reopen, and everything slow down, I found something. <clears throat> it seems that the framework is already in place. It's been put in place between Public Safety Canada and the Department of Homeland Security. And the purpose of this is to strengthen safety, security, and resilience of both Canada and U.S. infrastructure. And if you look at the bottom here, communications is part of that infrastructure. So we are talking both domestic and cross-border infrastructure, the need for collaboration, uh, accurate and timely matters of delivering of these communications. So my thought was, my last thought about developing this is what if we could use this U.S. Canada Emergency Management Assistance Mechanism to one day bring together Canada and the U.S. under auxiliary communications with the attempt, with the intent to raise awareness at national levels, forge agreements, work on plans and guidance, procedures, so on and so forth, so that maybe one day, one day, we'll be able to have cross-border communications in emergency situations without question and without any difficulties. That's sort of something that uh, I would love to see. I'd love to be able to do that and still re remain within the framework of Canadian emergency management programs and U.S. emergency management programs. So with that, <clears throat> thank you. And thanks to the Rat Pack for having me. Um, just to let everybody know before I turn this back over to uh, Dan there, the contents that are in this presentation have all been taken from uh, source documents that are available to the public. So you are more than welcome to 
look at these documentations that have been put out and uh, do the interesting reading. Some of it can be very boring, but uh, if you really want to get into it, you can follow up and see where I'm coming from and where these programs came from. So that is it for me, Dan. Hope I didn't talk everybody's ear off. There we go. Over to you, sir. Okay. I'm going to remove the spotlight from you. Hi, Barry. <laughs> Just picked up Barry when I did that. And now we'll look for questions. Barry, I think there's a lot of stuff in chat. You wanted to go ahead and take that? Okay, sure. Tom from Maryland wants to know, since many of us have no notion of how Canadian territories are governed, can you tell us if there is a separate territorial government or does the national government play a major role in territorial governance? <clears throat> nope. Uh, we have 10 provincial governments and we have three territories. We have the Yukon, Northwest Territories and Nunavut, all of which have their own governing bodies. All right. There are federal um, policies in place when it comes to indigenous people and stuff. But for the most part, all of our territories and provinces have their own governmenting system. I hope that helps. Okay. And he also wants to know how are the Oxcom resources requested and who has the authority to dispatch Oxcom personnel to another jurisdiction? <clears throat> well, at this point in time, we are only on stage one of our development. That is one of the stage two developments that we have not approached yet. We are still gaining support from NGOs and some governing bodies. So I'm hoping in another year or less, uh, depending on the pandemic and shutdowns and everything else, I'll be able to give you a better answer on that. Sorry, I don't have that at this time. It's okay. You're starting from scratch. It's great. Uh, anyone else in the, in the chat? Or if you have any other questions, please raise your hand. I think you did a great job. Not too many questions, I guess. No, I just bored everybody to death. <laughs> no, you did a pretty good presentation. You didn't have any questions to ask. Well, I still see the I, hands up. And all the questions have been answered in the chat. There's been some comments, but not, not nothing with questions. Well, I'll take so. comments. If there's comments on the program or suggestions or ideas, I know I've got some Canadians on here that have got comments and that. So feel free to uh, address those comments directly to me if you'd like. That's not a problem. Yeah, okay. I could maybe. It's Glenn here. Hi, good, great job, Jay. Um, the one, the one thing that I, that I wanted to add, just to make sure for everyone in the states to understand, um, we really don't have anything that. And I think Jay said this. Maybe I'm re-emphasizing it. Quite like FEMA in terms of uh, coming in and taking over in the case of an emergency. Partly, it's maybe the scale of our provinces and the size, but um, and and uh, you know we're a. Um, uh, federal system like yours, uh, but you know the the general feeling is most emergencies that are dealt with aren't national, and uh, so that the you know you don't <clears throat> we have there are fires in parts of the country and there are floods in other parts of the country, um, and the role of the federal government is, is and I guess FEMA does some of this. So I'm not really uh, but. Um, the federal government can provide resources in a case of a F Red River flood in the province of Manitoba. If it gets really bad, maybe they ask the military to come. If there's a really bad snowstorm in Toronto and they can't clear the streets, then they might ask the military to help with that. <laughs> that but has happened. <laughs> that, but but uh, by and large, it's the provinces that that um, uh, that that are mostly in control. And I guess the the the, the other. Um, and so that the other thing is that the kind and I suppose this is true in the states as well, the kind of emergencies that happen are different in the different regions. Um, you know, you, um, uh, 
you know, I think again in Manitoba, the Red River floods every two or three years and people have to, uh, have to handle that. And um, hams are important in being able to let people know if any dikes are gonna break because you don't have communications everywhere. Um, so the, um, the, I think our federal role is a lot more policy and planning and international discussions and it's not as operational, wouldn't you think, uh, Jay? You yes. talked a lot with them. Yes, it is. It is that way. And just we'll step back here for a minute. So Glenn is actually the president of Radio Amateurs of Canada. He neglected to mention that. That's why he knows a lot about what I'm doing here. But yes, he's absolutely right. Uh, there is there is some operational procedures and uh, programs through public safety and and that but uh, a lot of the times it's contracted through uh, other services like uh, the department of the uh, department of defense um, what is that um, research programs all right so we have other uh, federal programs that do offer money to groups and organizations to help develop programs and that and um that's sort of where Public Safety Canada partners up with. Any other questions or comments, please? Barry, I see some comments that you might want to read there. No, there's nothing that's really that important. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it is true. It, it is true. The FEMA does not come in and take over in a disaster. <clears throat> They're no. only there as a uh, as a resource for the states, and uh, FEMA can bring in some good resources, but the states still manage their disasters with the assistance of FEMA. And yes. The thing was, if we had had a snowstorm in Florida, we would need the military also. We would need more than the military. <laughs> well, you, you found yeah, that. I guess, I guess the, the one, the one, the big difference. In fact, that that really makes clear that the FEMA role is a lot like the the federal role in Canada. With the yes. difference that I don't think that that our federal agency has resources that it can can bring to play. You know, they, they're they more coordinating and the resources may in fact come out of other federal departments. You know, the military is the easiest one, but there might be others, right? Uh, Jay, they don't have a bunch of people that you can fly in from, from, yeah, from that group the way FEMA does. Well, yes and no, because we've seen this through the pandemic this year where we've been short on doctors and nurses and which that is where uh, public safety and emergency preparedness actually reached out to other provinces. Now, the pandemic has impacted all of us, so we, we know pretty much how that works. But um, when we do have shortages and just recently a declaration from Alberta went into public safety and emergency preparedness because of the state that is going on with the uh, pandemic there requesting air ambulance and other medical support so if they do not have people directly that can help this is where this resiliency planning comes in where they're able to have a pool of resources to reach out to whether it be through the consortium of ngos or it be through uh, provincial or territorial agencies. <clears throat> it works a lot the same way that FEMA works. And I did have that in one of my slides that even with the national support in the US, all right, the state or the local government or whoever's called in for that emergency support remains the same. They're in charge, all right? So it depends a lot on what agencies demand uh, counties demand, so on and so forth. So in general, this this whole misunderstanding of the differences between Canada and the U.S., really there's not that many differences. Some changes in names, organizations, we have a single federal organization that sort of manages stuff where you have Department of Homeland Security, you have FEMA, you have a number of uh, other smaller organizations that assist for the most part. Canada and the U.S.'s systems are very much the same. So interaction between the two can be done very easily. No, I wonder in the U.S. system, would, uh, would the other federal departments like uh, have, uh, have, have people who could help out in, e in emergencies? You know, I think that 
that's that's more the Canadian model, right? Well, I think we've got Hank on here, and we also have um, John Peterson and Steve, who have ties with federal agencies. So maybe one of them can fill us in a little bit on what they see from their point of view and the work that they do. Um, is our system fairly similar to yours? Do your agencies like FEMA have uh, pooled resources or do they have pre people that um, are directly responsible to deploy? I bet you they all ran away. I can't see everybody, Dan. Uh, this is John. FEMA can draw resources from, from other federal entities uh, rather quickly. Um, when it's just things like hurricanes and stuff, that, that word goes out well ahead of landfall. Uh, in the case of an earthquake, there are already plans in place between the entities. Uh, so an activation only takes hours. So you are correct. FEMA does have uh, uh, interagency agreements, MOUs, whatever you want to call it, mutual aid, uh, to all come to bear in a very short period of time. So again, very much the same as what we have here in Canada. So we're not all that different. I have a question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the E3 VCG. I don't want to give them my call. So. so they know who you are because it's my name up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that. That's it's, okay. It's my wife's computer, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm the new EC for Bruce County for ACS, and uh, I'm yep, going to I be received good. an email about you. Well, I'm pleased. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be going out uh, shortly and uh, talking to various um, fire, fire uh, chiefs and so forth around the area. I believe we have eight different divisions, different uh, uh, municipal areas, each one with its own um ec and uh theoretically eoc when uh, there is a declared emergency here that where those are stood up um and as if i if i followed your presentation um the object of the exercise is to get feedback from them and find out what they need and then use that as a basis for creating some kind of training program and um, presumably what the needs are here in Bruce County might be different than the needs in Ottawa. Um, okay, so is this, are we talking about a fairly localized, customized service that we, we will as amateurs be trying to provide to the served agencies? Yes, we will have our community response units, the same as the ARIES program, all right? So that will be your local community response. So in your area, you may cover the eight different areas. You may wanna break it up into four areas and be the EC and just have uh, team leaders that run it in different areas because it can be overwhelming. <clears throat> I am familiar with Bruce County, all right? So you do have eight independent areas, eight different EOCs, you have three mutual aid programs, uh, including a ninth program, which is through the Bruce Power and Generation System. Right. All right. So that is an independent organization. It's a private vendor, but they have their own system as well. So yeah. there's a lot to take in, a lot to understand. And as we develop the new OXCOM system in that, we will be here to help emergency coordinators develop better programs with these uh, management groups or uh, public uh, agencies like um, your fire services, police and everything else. So if you are going out, it is research gathering right now. You wanna find out what they need. And then if you need any further direction, your section manager for your area is Al Foley. He's okay. out of the New Lowell area. <clears throat> if you're not able to get a hold of him, please feel free to send me an email. And yes, I do know 
every single one of the section managers across Canada and who represent what areas. So <laughs> please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, okay. One from the chat. What is the rollout roll time for training ACS volunteers in Canada? <clears throat> we, we had hoped to be at rollout right now. So January, I will be doing the first public venue to reach out to our clubs and our affiliated clubs and any amateur radio operator across Canada that's interested in auxiliary communications. Um, we haven't got a date yet for that because I have to do book that um, through the, the uh, RAC webinar system. And um, I'm hoping to have dates out for that in December. The Rat Pack will be getting that information. I've already talked to Dan about that. So because it will be a coast to coast program, we do try to start it a little bit earlier because we have a number of different time zones to take into consideration. But um, we will keep in touch with Dan. If it falls into one of your training nights, we'll include that in there. So as to a tentative rollout date, we are still looking at the spring of 2022 for stage two rollout, which would be the first of the training programs. Uh, we have an offshoot training program, which is directed solely at Windlink. They've already developed the basic operational program, and I believe they are rolling it out now. They've had a couple of pilot programs that have been really, really good. So we're hoping that that will continue to take on until we're able to roll out the rest of the uh, the AC pro ACS program. <clears throat> I see a question here. Aren't your provinces a lot larger than most U.S. states? Um, yes and no. Prince Edward Island would probably fit inside of New York City. But uh, yes, um, some of our provinces, I mean, if I drive from my place in Ontario, it's two days to go to Manitoba, whereas it's a day and a half to go to uh, Nova Scotia. So it is some of our provinces are quite large. And you saw that with our um, the map that I put up, the density of our population is within 100 kilometers of your border and that there is some really wide open spaces in Canada. Uh, IMAX system for sending active resources to other states. Yes, Canada does have an interoperability plan. <clears throat> it is not with every single province, however. It is done mainly through Federal Reserve um, for personnel and all that. There are a couple of provinces, and that's more so in the East Coast, that do have uh, coordinated programs for uh, rolling out personnel if needed. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one more question if I could. Sure. Um, I have already had a discussion with um, uh, someone I know in Tilbermore, um, and uh, they are familiar with the uh, fire service up there. And yeah. they've told me that uh, a new um, radio system is currently being, well, it will be shortly, I guess, uh, installed. This is something to do with Bell. I don't know that much about it. It's a trunk system. It's, um, it's uh, encrypted, um, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and apparently it's going to be more reliable than the existing system like i said i have to get i have to get my head around all of that uh i understand that the province of ontario has pledged to replace um uh, outdated equipment in in for you know police fire ambulance services and that's ongoing i don't know that much about the program i've did, done a little reading on it but i know that um these systems have uh common failure points, let's put it that way. And I wonder if there will be any discussion about the existing systems and and uh, where they might fail and where we might need to prepare ourselves to, you know, be there when such things happen. Uh, so it's a very broad ranging question, I know, but 
I wonder if there's been any discussions on on uh, such matters. Yes. The short answer is yes. Okay. However, <clears throat> due to the nature of the conversations, that is something best handled on the Canadian side of the border, and I'd be more than willing to return an email and set up a meeting with you to discuss those. Um, these programs are in effect already in uh, Western Canada. We have had issues in Ottawa with the Belnet system, um, but for the most part, there are uh, very good feedback points that you can get a hold of, and I can uh, help you get a hold of that information. However, you do need to understand that this is part of the Canadian version of FirstNet. So right. um, <clears throat> there are a lot of differences, a lot of differences, and uh, it is an education, but you can find information at Public Safety Canada okay. about the program. Uh, it came about about uh, 10 years ago, and it is still in play today. Yeah. So there's a lot of information there. Okay. I asked the question mainly because, as I mentioned, I'm going to be going out talking to fire chiefs and whatnot, and I would like to not sound like an idiot if I'm talking about something and I have no idea uh, what actually exists, how it works, et cetera, and so forth. So getting up to speed on that, on those things, it also will help me to better understand the needs of uh, the people that I'm talking to. Well, I'll tell you this. If you want to reach out to me before you go meet any of the fire chiefs, please do so. And I'll put yep. you in contact with somebody in that area, especially if you're going to start from Tobamori. That may help you get in that door a little bit easier. Okay. All right. Thank you much. Now, I saw a question here. Do you have plans to utilize spontaneous volunteer amateurs during an event, or do they have to have additional training? Okay. So I have a question, a question that I've already sort of dealt with once before. <clears throat> As uh, Steve had said, I attended Peru in 2019 with Glenn, and um, we were talking about emergency communications. This question reminds me of the one that came up in Peru and uh, an issue that uh, was actually going on in Chile. So in Chile, they have 5,000 radio amateurs as of last month, all of which get involved in emergency communications. Now you have to remember that Chile has earthquakes almost every other day. So utilizing spontaneous volunteers can be done as long as they're trained to go to an auxiliary net and await for assignments. All right, they cannot enter a, uh, an emergency net because then you get QRM. You actually have people that are interfering with the operation. All right, and this is what was happening in Chile. They had so many people calling in that the messages that needed to get to their government agencies were not getting through. All right, because, you know, somebody wanted to tell them about uh, John and, and Joe and, you know, Sylvia's aunt and uncle that saw this and they weren't sure if they saw it on the radio or the news or whatever because they're all hysteric and they're going back and forth. So yes, we are looking at what happens when we have volunteer amateurs jump into a net. And that's why we do net training and the national sets and everything else. But do you need to have training? If you're going to be effective in an emergency environment, the bottom line is if you're not trained to be there, don't be there. That is the most critical thing I can say to anybody whether you're an amateur radio operator or not if you are not trained do not be there look after yourself look after your families disasters start with you all right don't worry about jumping on use it as a way to get information uh, What 
the heck is that? <laughs> Uh, okay. I said, a disaster in, in, a, in the communication system. They had a shrew cut through a fiber optic cable. And so they reduced oh, their communication. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, and they went into fail safe. <clears throat> that, we have animals in Canada that, that can cut through communication lines without any problems whatsoever. In case any of you have ever met a moose, all right, if you're driving and you see a moose, stop the car. Don't hit it because you will not have a car left. You will be riding the moose home. Okay, so yes, we have animals up here that can destroy communication systems as well. Especially beavers. Beavers like telephone poles. You know, they'll, they'll just eat the pole, it'll fall over, and you'll be without communications. Any other questions? Just a comment. Yes. Um, the point was that without good planning around redundancy, as somebody brought up earlier, you're going to have those single points that will really tear things apart. So, you know, you need to have a system very similar to the old McCullough fire alarms that major cities had, where every wire had to leave the building in two different directions, and every post had to be served from two different directions, and they could signal by ground return and the computer gurus don't understand that. <laughs> well, yes and no. Many of the systems do have redundant relays that are built into it. But that's sort of another talk um, on the modernization of communications. And if you look carefully, most emergency management programs that are being put in place today, they actually run like a mesh network. So. There are multiple redundancies within the system, so if one fails, it'll continue down the path of another system. So when we, we as operators, amateur radio operators, say when all else fails, you know, we're there to pick up the pieces. The all else fails, um, it kind of went out the window about two decades ago because in order for us to get a call if we rely on the when all else fails we're going to be waiting a very long time <clears throat> and um if we are still going to look at that sort of analogy if we're not at the table today working with these organizations and understanding where we're going what we're doing what our job is when all else fails everything fails because you will not have the resources, you will not have the education or the understanding of what's going on around you. And uh, if you're coming in cold and don't know what's going on, unfortunately, <clears throat> you're not going to be able to do the job like they showed in that beautiful movie Independence Day where amateur radios and shortwave operators came together around the world and coordinated this international airstrike taking down all these aliens. I mean, if the aliens were that smart to come to Canada um, and take out our communications to begin with, you think they wouldn't have figured out what amateur radio can do? Um, the likelihood of our survivability when all else fails? We use radio services. If the radio services failed in other areas, we may be able to do things that other services can't do, but there is still the possibility that we will fail as well. So we have to keep that in mind when we boast the, 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 the terms when all else fails. I mean, an EMP is an EMP, and if you're plugged in, you're shut down. All right, so yes, there are redundancies there, Tom. There are a lot of things, but I'm sure that one of these days, Dan will coordinate with somebody, and they'll come in and talk about advanced emergency communication systems. And maybe you, you'd like to hear about FirstNet and the redundancies that they have in it and the failures that they have, because some of the failures are kind of funny. <clears throat> Any other questions? And I hope I didn't offend anybody about the uh, when all else fails thing, because it's one of those things that I don't preach about anymore, because I, I personally don't like it. But if I offended anybody, I apologize.
this is why we have this open. We're welcome, you know, be polite and courteous, but uh, you're welcome to speak your mind. And uh, um, that's what this is about. This has been really good. I really appreciate this. I might point out something real quick. Our scheduling now is up through, uh, filled pretty much through December, going into next year. We want to accommodate you guys. We want to accommodate you guys. The, uh, the, the people here in the States is doing Oxon and Oxon and Ecom and all that. So let us know ahead of time if you would like to us do something for you and we can see how we can juggle things around and make that happen. Just don't say, hey, we'd like to be on next Thursday. That might be a rough one to pull off. But uh, let us know ahead of time, and uh, we'll go from there. Not a problem. OK. Uh, right, that was a fantastic presentation. It Thank was. You. I, it I, is. Think, I think there's a hand that went up there. I don't know whose, because I can't see. That's Tom. Tom. OK. Tom, go ahead. I just wanted to say that it, I've never liked that slogan, and I think it's insulting to emergency managers and professional responders, and I'm allergic to using it. I'm, I'm not condemning whoever invented it. I, you know, it's a great morale booster, but in the wrong direction. It's too ego-stroking and not enough humility, my personal opinion. Thank you, Tom. All right. There's I think we can wrap this up, Dan. We got one more raised hand there. Uh, okay, Dan, the other Dan from California. AJ, you did a spectacularly good job the whole time. Um, Dan, unfortunately, you muted yourself as you were going through there. Yep. I got the whole time, and then you went boop. Sorry. Um, the, the fact that 90% of Canada's population is within 100 kilometers or miles of the border with the U.S. left me thinking, what's the status of communications with the other 10%? And I imagine that a lot of that is our Native Americans and um, resource exploitation companies or resource you know, developers. Um, and just how, where do they fit into um, the plans for you? First of all, how widespread is amateur radio in that remaining 10% that is, I don't know, something more than 90% of the land mass? Well, in Northern Ontario, <clears throat> we actually have, I believe it's 15 different groups in that section. And uh, they are very well spread out throughout that section all of which have very good um, programs set up with their local communities in that. The, um, there are infrastructure programs in place. And of course, we've all heard of Starlink. So, you know, there are things that are developing for our Northern programs. And Bell Canada also has uh, a linking system that they're using. So does Rogers in that. But um, one of the reasons why we were brought into the Northwest Territories, which is really up there, um, was because of those communication failures, because they basically have one line in, one line out. And uh, when those communities lose that line, they are without communication, sometimes for an entire weekend, sometimes a week. So this is why we were working with them. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we had to slow things down. There are um other programs that i am working on to help those communities to coordinate community effort with auxiliary communications however i didn't bring that into a lot of play tonight because this was more about introducing you to some of our emergency management and uh, where we're going with a little bit of the auxiliary communications but yes <coughs> unfortunately my role does mean that I have to do my due diligence sometimes, look into demographics and where people are. I am working with a group out of Northern British Columbia, and it's a very unique situation because on one side of them is a mountain, the other side of them is a mountain, and there's two valleys that they can sort of get communications through, and there's six fire units that are requ requesting communications. Now, I don't know about you guys, but getting a helicopter to fly up on top of a mountain gets very, very expensive, especially for amateur radio. So 
there are very unique situations in Canada that have to be looked at specifically for those areas. And um, we are going to be working with groups to be able to develop programs. Our WinLink team is already um, working within certain parameters of how to deploy WinLink across Canada. And they've already come up with a lot of different questions. I think they probably come up with more questions than what we thought we had to start with. And they're doing a great job, but it does not happen overnight. There are so many different circumstances across Canada for communications. Um, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing program. So nothing's written in, in stone here. It's all fluid. And uh, I don't think it'll ever be quite written in stone. It'll all be something that we can adjust as we need. Thank you for the question. Hope that answers. Yeah, quite well. Thank you. I pulled a Dan trick. I, I muted myself and started talking. Thanks, Dan. <coughs> um, at any rate, there any, anything else out there? Any comments, uh, questions, answers? This has been a great presentation. It's been great to see our northern uh, brothers. And uh, I didn't see any sisters out there, but hello, Canada. And I uh, hope to see you guys some more. At, uh, at this point, uh, we've been in here almost an hour and a half. This has been, a, uh, it's gone long, but that's okay. When we have good presentations, we don't mind the go along stuff. So uh, we're going to uh, probably shut this down shortly. Going to give it another pass here. Are there any more questions? Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a great night. Yes, thank you very much. 73 is everyone. Thank you, Dan.